Hello, good afternoon. I uh, hope you guys all enjoyed a good lunch or sahtin to everybody. Uh, just to give you and like let you be in the loop this way, this track today, this afternoon, will be featuring top investors highlighting their investment strategies and the market trends. There's going to be a panel on corporate investments and technology. And last but not least, the progress and challenges in the Kuwaiti startup ecosystem. Now, before I introduce the upcoming panel, we'll be first playing a video that's been produced by the ArabNet team. Video, please. All right, so the next panel is Understanding Regional Investors, which will be moderated by Prashant P.K. Jalati, who is the founder of the Smart, Start, the Smart Start Fund and the Assembly. Please welcome on stage. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here and to welcome a very illustrious set of speakers who are joining me on this panel. Uh, let me invite in the sequence as they're sitting, Faris Gaddur, the partner, Vamda Capital. Omar al Majdway, founder partner of Raid Ventures. Walid Al-Banna, partner, ST Ventures. And last but not the least, the local superstar, Yusuf Hamad from Beko Capital. Gentlemen, I know this is the wrong time starting just after lunch. I'm sure everybody's yawning away and we had good lunch. But let's start with something which is going to be 
something which you all may want to hear about. What is the status of venture capital in the Middle East today, in the region today? And let me start with somebody who's probably done the maximum number of investments in this region. Omar, why don't you start talking okay. about what you think is happening? Okay. Um, I think now we're in the stage of uh, growth. I see it exponential. Maybe, maybe I'm over uh, exaggerating a little bit, but uh, we, I started before two years, uh, Right Ventures, and uh, I cannot see what I'm seeing now. I couldn't see what I'm seeing now. It's very, very fast growing. The uh, number of deals that we are receiving now is much higher. The quality of uh, startups that we are receiving now are much, much, much better than before. And uh, you can notice also that uh, we saw also in, in 2017 in particular that we have about three or four new growth VCs like SD Ventures, like uh, Dubai Holding, uh, now uh, Bonda uh, will, uh, will uh, announce a new fund, the MEVP announced a new fund. All of them are going to the next phase, which is the growth. And this is very healthy. And, it's the, and the region deserves this uh, focus and this uh, uh, amount of money to the innovation ecosystem. Without it, we cannot really grow, we cannot have uh, a better GDP, we cannot have a better life for all of us here. So, I'm very optimistic of what I'm seeing in 2017. I think 2018 and 19 will have uh, much bigger deals, much bigger tickets, much bigger rounds, and also you will see all of the ecosystem inspired and uh, getting up. So, so if you look around, so we've seen pretty substantial deals in 2016-17. You know, starting with the, the large one, Amazon coming in, you know, acquiring Stoop. We have seen the start of the billion-dollar start of Noon. We have seen very substantial investments in other rounds, Karim doing a multi $100 million round. When you look at all these things, obviously the market is growing, but the topic that we've been given is to talk about the ROI, the return on investment. And I think as a startup ecosystem which is new, which is actually budding, our ROI is in multiple ways. It's not just return on money, which we will probably see when the funds close. So maybe one of you wants to actually talk about how the ROI is actually what we are looking at. Maybe, Waleed, since you have a very large portfolio, like, you know, cor corpus as well as a large responsibility in that sense. Sure. Um, so the idea behind the fund, our fund is called STV. It's the second fund for uh, STC. And it came about when STC started uh, looking into its growth strategy for the next uh, few years and uh, for the non-core growth into other areas, especially the digital area, where a lot of the value that the telecom companies were seeing were, uh, was actually migrating into those uh, ecosystems. And uh, the CC believed in to stay relevant in those new ecosystems, they had to grow with the ecosystem and uh, not try and do everything uh, by themselves. So this is how we decided to go with the venture capital as our vehicle for non-core growth in, uh, in the digital. Uh, the fund size is $500 million. It has independence because it requires new DNA, but it also has access to the assets that STC has. And we want to employ those assets and the experience and the position that STC has into raising the ecosystem, but not as a CSR uh, approach. Uh, what, what we believe in is creating shared value. We believe that if we do our VC work correctly, the financial returns are the major metric, but the outcome is going to be beneficial for everyone in the ecosystem. And that's how we go about it. Mm -hmm. um, Faris, uh, this is the second fund you've been associated with, after Mina Ventures, Vamda, and now Vamda second fund. Right. So you've seen a substantial you know, spread over the region, like starting from Lebanon to right. the whole of Arabia. And what is the major trend that you're seeing in the last few years? So tre trends, you mean um, at, the, at the industry level you were investing so, at, or so, so trends both. of first the asset of all, class? First, first of all, like as an asset class, I believe, sure. I think I hear everybody saying that right. it seems to have matured as an asset class. Yeah. So I think as an asset class, and I don't want to be um, particularly pessimistic, um, because I'm not. I'm actually quite optimistic. Um, but I think the asset class is, is as good as the underlying is. Um, and I think unlike 
what it is in the U.S. where, you know, you have a lot of funds and, you know, the funds are actually the, uh, the supply and the startups are the demand, uh, which, you know, which kind of flips it on its head or, or what, rather than what we traditionally thought it was. Today, in the MENA region, you have the advantage of working with uh, a few players. So these sorts of existential questions about venture are not as prevalent um, in the MENA region as they are. When you say a few players, you mean the VCs? You mean the investors? Right, I mean, so investors, in, investors, investors yes. Yeah. So, I, the, so I, say, and I say underlying because it's not, the game in the MENA region is not just about VCs. It's about corporates as well, and it's about family offices who want to get into this. And, 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 it's under, and it's about the underlying because the underlying here still has a lot more demand uh, than there is supply of capital, which is not necessarily the case abroad. However, if we were to look at the asset class in the US, venture does not perform better than you know, the S&P 500 has performed. Um, and if you look deeper at that, the standard deviation curve is very skewed towards five or six or even top 10 VCs who generate outsized returns and the rest actually perform way worse than the S&P 500. So bundling together the asset class into one in the US has proven to be a fallacy and has proven to be a model that I think is unsustainable. And if we were to look at that and learn from that in any way, I think we need to be on our toes um, and we need to look and say, and not to kind of drink our own Kool-Aid as VCs and say, right, what we've done is great uh, for the ecosystem, uh, but it's still about the underlying. If the underlying finds that they are able to get um, better dollars elsewhere or more efficient capital elsewhere or get, you know, much shorter closing cycles elsewhere, they will absolutely go with it. We are only as good as the underlying assets are and um, and the trend has so, so far been favorable. But the reason I point out that distinction is because fundamentally speaking, we are there to serve the startups. Um, we don't go hand in hand indefinitely. Um, so we need to kind of con constantly find ways to innovate. Uh, the asset class is maturing, um, but the dollar is increasingly becoming commoditized, meaning the startup a, a dollar invested in a startup is a dollar invested in a startup. You need, the onus is on you as an investor to show that the dollar you're investing is actually worth a dollar 10, a dollar 20. Um, that's where you start really having, you know, elbowing between investors and, 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 and the kinds of things that, you know, the question of requiring, the question LPs ask about how you're different is now becoming prevalent in fund two. When we were doing MENA Venture Investments in 2009, that was never a question. This was simply part of allocations for LPs in emerging markets, and MENA so happens to be part of those markets. It was just a question of allocation. Now it's a question of, well, why do I give you money and not give you know, another person like Becco or someone like that? I mean, that's, that's the honest truth, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, for someone like SD Ventures, they have their defensibility around the, the, the telco infrastructure on them, and as well as having a great team. Uh, a lot of the Saudi investors as well, uh, who, who have started out early on, have identified that the gap is in bridging a lot of these startups that start abroad going into Saudi. Beko were also one of the, the, you know, the first movers, so they have their first mover advantage, but this will increasingly become a question whereby entrepreneurs ask, what can you do for me that another investor can't, and hence trickle up to the LP that says, well, tell me what, what that is. Tell me, prove to me you're gonna get access because you need to make me better returns than I can make elsewhere. And the LP does not think the same way we think. The LP thinks in terms of not how many vent venture funds do I invest in, he thinks in terms of how much overall do I wanna have allocated in venture, and that's usually three to 5%, and then everything else. LPs can ditch venture in a second because it's not part of core strategy, not so like let me, let, me, let me try and understand. Yeah. Like you, you touched I on hope I made sense. I don't uh, know you, if you, I made you, sense. You touched on a, a, a gamut of topics now. Yeah. And 
So when you say underlying, I think you mean two underlying people. You mean LPs on one side as underlying people right. who ask questions. On the other side, you talk about underlying people who are the asset which is, you know, yeah, the the entrepreneurs yeah. or startups you've invested in. Now, when you look at it from that aspect, I would take this as a positive that the LP is not just giving you money. He's actually asking you questions 100%. and actually bringing in the intangibles. Right. So Yusuf, you are in the same space in the sense doing early stage investing. So do you also see your LPs asking these kind of questions? Do you see them becoming more involved? Or do you see them more invested you know, into this class? So I think, like, I think some of them, uh, 20 to 30% of the LPs are asking these questions. Why should I invest in you versus the invest in another local venture capital fund? But I think the struggle remains, why should I invest in this as an asset class? And then if I'm interested in this asset class, why should I invest in this asset class in the region versus outside of the region? This, this, these two subjects, kind of convincing them of venture capital as a business model and as an industry, and then convincing them of the region, and, this is the, and why this is the arbitrage and the golden opportunity in the region. By the time we get to talk about ourselves and us versus the other funds, it's 70% or 80% of the work is done. So you're already, you're already. A, yeah, you already got in. to, you know, yeah. you're meeting four uh, or so. So I think that's, that's for us has been uh, really convincing regional money into, into putting money into their own region, into the ecosystem, the only ecosystem, in my opinion, that's going to grow, which is technology versus everything else, which is kind of going down and being commoditized, real estate and oil and gas and, 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 and er energy and construction. So, so uh, you know, taking this thought forward, so I see conflicting thoughts, my opinion. On one side, you see very few of your LPs have started asking those questions, where the It's a good sign we have different LPs, it means, so. Sorry? It's a good sign, because it means we're talking to different LPs. That's, that's <laughs> good. So there's a, there's a larger pool of LPs to pool. actually pitch on. <laughs> so, so, but coming back to the, you know, so if that is the case, one of the bigger thoughts that has been asked about all the time in terms of ROI, is one of the things which the governments in this region or people who are in power always talk about is job creation. So one of the things that is, you know, a kind of a social kind of pressure on us, if not legally, is to actually look at it from that ROI too, to look at local startups getting that kind of support. So how much of the LPs are actually looking at that as something which they want to do besides getting, for, you know, financial ROI? or if that ROI comes at a cost of losing some financial ROI, they're okay with it. Do you see that, uh, Omar? Okay. Uh, we are a place that we have only one LP, so we, we have uh, very small uh, co uh, negotiations with them. Uh, the, uh, the social aspect was one of the points that we were discussing when we established the right ventures. Shall we put it? as a mandate or shall we put it as a measurement to see the effect of this uh, fund. And not only this, social and strategic and financial. We had, we had three things to discuss in uh, establishing the uh, fund because the fund originally established as a corporate VC. So we were discussing, shall we put the mandate to serve, for example, companies in logistics or shall we just seek the financial returns from any company in the, in the region, or shall we also put uh, um, a condition of social impact as, a, as part of the investment? But uh, studying some of the uh, uh, previous uh, attempts in the, in the West and uh, in the East, we found that the most successful and sustainable VCs are those who are focused in financial returns only. And, uh, and uh, we saw for example, Coca-Cola, they had one of the uh, accelerators or funds that they shut it down last year or this year, maybe early this year. And it was corporate and it was intent, intended to uh, build ecosystem around Coca-Cola. And it wasn't really successful or good idea at that point. And we saw many of, uh, of uh, strategic uh, investments failed because of the commercial, the strong commercial sense that they are lacking comparing to those who are more agile than them. So we focused on the financial returns and we, we, we agreed that to measure the strategic and the social impact of this fund, but not as a condition to, uh, to invest. And I think we are blessed for, for that because we, the less restrictions in investing, the better the speed of, of uh, deals and deal closing and, and speed of getting also better deals and better returns. So this is what we ended up then. 
So, so, so coming to the next step in the sense you're seeing a lot of the inflow coming from the region at this point of time. And now if you're only focusing on the ROI, which is, you know, basically coming from the region, you may not get enough, is something which some of the VCs actually look at. But one of the ways in which internationally people have actually got better ROI is actually to specialize. Specialize the area you invest in, specialize also, you know, the, 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 the age of the startup, like how early or late that startup is, is, is also something which, do you think that line is clear here or everybody's writing, writing checks everywhere? Like I, when I talk to people, you know, VCs, one of the message which doesn't come clearly to me is that saying that we do early stage, we do mid stage, or we do growth. Everybody seems to be at least wanting to be in every space. So at least, you know, especially with you, with the kind of mandate you have, which is a very specific growth mandate, you know, if you look at it from that aspect, do you think that clarity is there? Are we really creating an assembly line which is required, like from end to end, or are we focused on certain areas and not specializing enough? Uh, that's actually an important uh, area. Um, so, on uh, one hand, uh, MENA as a market is very small compared to many other mo international markets. So you really cannot limit yourself to one place and, uh, and one specific uh, spe specialization. But uh, on the other hand, if uh, most of the VCs are being concentrated or being crowded in one area and not in another in that life cycle, that creates a problem. One of the challenges we're seeing for startups coming go, going forward is with, with the exit. How are these startups that are getting funding right now, lots of funding, are going to be exiting the next five, six, seven years? This is an area where we, we have some uh, you know, uh, concerns. So it's a balance that you have to do. Uh, it's an uh, investment thesis you have to develop. And the investment thesis can, can sometimes be general, can be sometimes very specialized. But as long as you're disciplined around the thesis, then that uh, should be okay. The other part of it is defining the role between the VCs and the government. It's very important to uh, divide those roles uh, appropriately. Where does the government step in? Where does it move out of the way? Uh, and it has to change with time as, the, as the facts come, uh, come to sight. And uh, for in Saudi Arabia, for example, there's an active discussion right now between many of these VCs and the different government agencies affecting that uh, ecosystem. And it's still challenging to, you know, uh, reach a, you know, an agreement around it, but at least there's a transparency, transparency and discussion between the two sides on what should happen and where the uh, problems are, uh, are being and how are those problems should be approached. Should the market resolve those problems or is this the kind of problem that only the government can resolve and vice versa? Well, my personal opinion, the government should stay absolutely away from the startups, correct? Exactly. They should give their money to VCs or invest the in the specialists and let them invest in startups, you know, rather than having a government official sitting on your board and doing things which he's probably not trained for or capable of. Uh, uh, so we, we have the opinion where uh, we, we think the, instead of focusing on the government as an investor, that the government can do a lot of work in the regulatory part and also as a customer. Enabling part of that. As a customer. I mean, uh, governments are usually big customers for uh, startups around the world. And you have DARPA, for example, which created, uh, which helped create Silicon Valley. Correct. Was doing that kind of thing. Including uh, driverless. So, cars. yeah, this is the normal market dynamics we want to see. Yeah. So let me ask a question from, for example, uh, Faris and especially from Yusuf. And uh, for those who do early stage investing, are you seeing this assembly line coming up? Like in the sense people coming <coughs> and picking up your investments and taking them to the next level? Um, so... I think, I think a good analogy here is um, if I flip the question around and ask, have you, have any of the 50 million plus or 100 million plus companies today value in the MENA region come out of an accelerator? Chances are, you, you, you know, as far as I, my thinking goes, it, the answer is no. And the reason is, the model of an accelerator is a Western model. And I use the accelerator as a benchmark for stage. So it could be some you know, specialization on series A, B, so have you. An accelerator's fundamental flaw today in the region is that it leaves you exposed and in the open when you graduate. Uh, among other flaws with the accelerator model, uh, and among you know, 
mostly beneficial, but among other flaws. But the one flaw is that there is no one there to pick up the check after. So in the US, when someone gets out of 500 startups or Y Combinator, there are so many lined up to invest. We don't have the pleasure at this point in the ecosystem to say the same. Um, is that a failure of VCs rather than accelerators? So it, it is. So it is a failure of VCs in that they're not, they don't understand how to source the right constituents. And the right constituents are at any stage. Because you have to, every single deal we go into, we assume, regardless of stage, we assume that the next fundraise, w I mean, it's a very conservative assumption, but we assume that the next fundraise is probably going to be either picked up by us, almost in its entirety, or bridged by us. And it's not, this is not anecdotal, this is empirical, this is what's actually been happening. I mean, we don't live in an ecosystem that is well served in a way that allows for a VC to specialize. Because guess what, if you're only doing Series V, good luck getting access to pipeline, first of all. Second of all, good luck making upside, because you make more upside on the earlier stage stuff. And, and, and third of all, good luck, you know, actually Series V is a little different, because Series V, let's say 50 million plus, that's when you start having PE. But let's say Series A, for example. If we were, to, as Wanda, to come and say, we only want to do Series A, and we don't want to do C, we are really restricting our access to deal flow. And it could even be as, you know, maybe futile as saying that, you know, some funds do seed stage investments that are essentially marketing checks. They're not even, they're written off on deployment. I mean, 500 also does this in the US where they're like, you know, our first check is not the check that's going to make us return. The first check is our due diligence check. In order to have, it's so competitive out there, and it's, it's starting to happen here as well, where the first check is actually the check that allows you to know which ones you actually want to invest in out of your fund or not. So we don't have the pleasure of being selective on the seed or stage. Uh, the, I have a counterpart counter yeah, on sure. this, and maybe let me ask Omar. Yeah. Is it because the VCs don't work together? We is work together. We all uh, work together. Well, let's, That's let's, let's account it. Yeah. Just let it be. You know. <laughs> don't, don't be defensive on that. The no. point I'm saying is like, is it because the VCs just don't work together? Everybody wants their own proprietary deal, and I want my kingdom, and so and so has his own kingdom. Is that what it is? It's a, it's a double edged question. Like, do you think so? No, I think uh, we are working together very well uh, in, the, in the ecosystem currently. And I'm sure, I hope that it will continue this way. But. Uh, most of the, our deals are syndicated with others, and um, yeah, like also with Wanda, like with uh, Beko, with uh, founded startups. Most of the VCs are talking to each other, and um, also, but it's uh, but we knew when we want to, to syndicate, we want to make sure that the uh, syndicates are adding value to each to this company in a proper way. So uh, yeah, I think uh, we are talking to each other. We are not isolated. Some are trying to isolate themselves, and I'm sure that they cannot continue. Uh, because this uh, startup, if you want to grow faster, you need to have more power to, um, to grow. And without having uh, collective power, I think it's very difficult to, to grow fast and compete others. And by the way, there is, sorry to interrupt, but there is a fund, I won't name it, but there is a fund that took a different approach to, to venture. And you know, they take a bit larger checks. Where is it today? They were exactly, very, yeah. fr from day one, they were very deliberate about wanting to play alone. And where are they today? Mm. They're not on the stage. They don't show up on stage anymore. They've tried out their model. It just didn't work. You cannot play alone. Yeah. And I think the reason is, and, and sorry to interrupt again, I think the reason is partially because there's just not enough capital. So if a company needs $15 million, I can't write that kind of check. I can write up to five. But the second reason is, it's a good way to spread risk. I don't want to take on the full risk myself. I want to be able to spread risk around the ecosystem because that's the way you create upside for everyone equally. But anyway, so, so you know I what's uh, to uh, thank you, thank you for this. It's very very good what you said just before uh, this is uh, when we go to the pre-seed or seed uh, level and take and give small tickets. It's uh, it's something that we might compete at that stage. Especially in this region, I'm talking about because this region still, we, uh, as you see, it's not really enough uh, seed and uh, fund here. 
So even if uh, ST Ventures want to succeed, I think they should have a partition in their, in their uh, VC for the seed and pre-seed to at least make sure that they see what's happening there. Yeah. And uh, without it, it will be difficult. And maybe at that point, we, want, we might compete with each other in getting the, uh, or in bidding on the, on the right startup. After that, if we don't syndicate, we don't talk to each other, I think we cannot continue as exactly Faris, what, he, what Faris said. It's very difficult to continue alone. And even the startup cannot, will not really appreciate having uh, you on, the, uh, uh, on board alone. It's, it's, uh, it's an ecosystem and you need to get the best out of it and, and uh, help your startup growing faster than anybody else. So should can we I, take, Can sorry. I just uh, add to, to a little bit? So I think, look, we're still a very, we're all in our first, second, maybe some of us are getting to their third fund. There's a very still young ecosystem. So we have to, we have to cooperate with each other. But having said that, I think as you, as you develop, your strategy gets honed and gets, it, it gets built up. And strategy and focus doesn't mean necessarily that I'm gonna take out an entire round. It could be a geography, it could be a specific stage, it could be a few verticals. We all have different views in the world and which verticals can work and which verticals don't. We are based in Dubai, the, uh, the guys are based in Riyadh. Um, uh, Fadis and Amba for a long time were based in Jordan, so obviously you get better, stronger network and, and, and deal flow over there. So there will always be a specialization, whether it's geography or stage or sector, and it's gonna only get better over time. So I think the, the assembly line has not fully form, been formed yet, but I think you, you can slowly see who's heading towards what and, and which stages and which sectors. But like the, both gentlemen said, we're definitely going to continue to cooperate. I don't think it's, it's a matter of you know, winner takes all um, at the moment because the scarcity of capital, uh, the demand in the region is just ridiculous in terms of requirement for capital. We're the, you know, some of the youngest region, we're the youngest region in the world and we have, uh, we have a lot of capital to spend. Uh, I think our median age is 22 years old versus a global average 28. We, our average GDP capita is really high and and in terms of dollar per capita that's going into venture capital, the US is 250, China is 20, India is six. Us in the region, if you just exclude Karim and Souk, because the last rounds weren't really venture capital, we're about $2. So we are much bigger, we're much more ready for a takeoff from a consumer perspective and the demand side, but the supply side is so weak. So we're always gonna, we're never gonna be able to fill opportunities except if we work together. So the assembly line is, is, is forming, but it's, you know, two plus one and then two plus one, and it's always going to be, you know, um, a party round to an extent of VCs. So, 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 again, I'm a bit confused. On one side, we are saying we've got so much deal flow coming, so much requirement of early stage capital. Then in that case, you shouldn't syndicate, actually. You should spray as much as possible to get as many of those people money on one side. On the other side, we don't have enough LP, which I agree with, that not yeah. enough, hey, this class has not matured to the level where the amount of money, you know, and taking your numbers, you know, one, six, you know, there's a big, big pathway to go to reach anywhere close to any, you know, kind of worthwhile ecosystem. So what do the people who are in the market do? You know, there'll be a lot more people who will not get money, as simple as that. There'll be startups here in the room who will not get the money or the investment that they need, you know, because just because there's not enough. You know, you cannot possibly a few VCs or the number of VCs. So what's the solution of this? Okay, I mean, you cannot spray. You cannot spray because if I spray, if I spread, instead of giving one startup a million dollars, if we put it across 10 startups as 100K, they're gonna survive for six months and all 10 are gonna die. You really have to focus. So what's the solution? So I think, I think the solution is there is an arbitrage opportunity today in this market. The, in the, uh, the traditional industries are, sl are slowing down. The, for God's sake, the governments have woken up to it and the and, and Saudi government are putting billions into the technology sector. We need more money that, that can come into this sector. I think only by that is when you start seeing specializations in the venture capital and in the investor community. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's when, they, when the deal flow starts to prosper. So, so all 10 startups that, that have the ability to make it, they're all gonna get a million rather than each one gets 100K. Yes, uh, the, I have two comments on this. Uh, I, I think... Uh, my job is to provocate you, by the way. <laughs> Thank so you. Don't, yes. I don't believe everything I'm saying myself. <laughs> so uh, I, I, am, I am provoked uh, on this because, uh, first, uh, first of all, I think uh, for many startups, uh, money is overrated. Uh, the currency that is really in demand, that is not uh, 
found plentiful in the market is trust. Mm -hmm. uh, we have blockchain of, for that. I'm sorry? We have blockchain for that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but uh, establishing trust is something that uh, many startups uh, are not doing. And this uh, hurts them and their mentality about bootstrapping and what's the role of money exactly uh, uh, is, is something that uh, needs to be uh, taken into consideration. Uh, the second thing is, uh, where, where is that money really needed? Uh, is it early stage? Is it between B, C rounds? Is it in the exit side? I think the money is not distributed uh, evenly across those mm -hmm. stages. And we're seeing a death valley where in the middle, lots of the problems are happening. And now we're seeing that being uh, Result. Uh, and from the exit side, we also need to see the market dynamics again working. So strategic buyers, for example, not just you know doing IPOs. We want to see local big companies saying, okay, I, this is my best vehicle to, uh, to grow, is through acquisition of uh, some of the startups in the spaces that are related to that. In fact, uh, you know, the biggest uh, vehicle of acquisition is trade buying. In fact, the two biggest you know, acquisitions that we all talk about are trade buys. The exits in our part of the world have been trade buys, if you look at it. We look at, uh, you know, uh, Stoop being bought by Amazon, it's a trade buy. You know, that they're coming to the region buying somebody from. Now, Google buys a few hundred startups every year. Facebook buys similarly. This is how they do talent acquisition. Isn't this probably a better way for this region to look at in terms of actually going and looking at startups? So I, I, I know some of you, in fact, you started as a corporate VC arm. So don't you think more and more of this should come in? Like because the class will grow when it will grow. But maybe we can encourage corporates to actually go in this direction. So, so you mean like, uh, like acqui-hire type? Acqui-hire or add a new line of business. Right. Uh, you know, Yusuf just said like traditional, when we all know traditional businesses are going down or they're established businesses which are generating good cash flows but they know their future is kind of limited in terms of years. You know, we see that the oil-based economy is going to change. So we can see that we can use that asset maybe in that way. Um, so I, the, the, um, the acquisitions that have happened so far, um, and this is just me thinking, you know, coming up with an answer now, but have been acquired. Amazon does not go into a market um, and acquire a similar business. Amazon acquires businesses that they want to get into. So Whole Foods, they weren't into that. Amazon rarely, if ever, acquires uh, e-commerce businesses and markets they want to go to. They like to go and build from the ground up, especially when the ecosystem is not mature at the, 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 the uh, uh, last mile end and the payments end. So they'd rather, if the market's not mature, I might as well build it myself. But, so, Amazon didn't acquire Soup for... In so let's not go into Amazon. I yeah. don't want to... No, no, I'm saying in, in general. So I'm saying that uh, it already is happening. So Noon's acquisition of Jadu Padu is an acqui-hire. That didn't play out well for them. Noon's it acquisition... Acqui it was acqui-hire. Yeah. It was an acqui-hire for sure. It was an acqui-hire. I mean, there's no doubt, right? No, no, um, don't go into too much detail, otherwise people yeah. will start speaking more. Let's, but, but let's then, go to the next but one. Then, okay, we're but, open about it. <laughs> but then you, you also have uh, you also have Labad's acquisition of uh, Namshi was not because of Namshi. Labad acquired Namshi because he wanted Faraz to run Noon, and there is absolutely no doubt about that. And Faraz said, "You want to acquire me? You want me to build Noon? You've got to acquire my company." So it is happening, and there is absolutely no doubt about it. And we were talking about this earlier. The fallacy becomes when businesses come and say, "Actually, I want to build this myself." Well, good luck building it. You might, it might work, it might not. At Tayyar in Saudi are doing a very good job at it in terms of like investing in businesses because they, because they know that's their future, but they're not going and saying, oh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm gonna build my own business that does this, this, or that. Acqui hires are, an acquisition of a business, just because it's above $100 million does not mean it's not an acqui hire. That's my opinion. No, no, so uh, yeah. we won't talk about it. What I'm saying is, can we make this into a class? In the sense, can we encourage people who have these cash flows like or our existing businesses kind of to yeah. start looking at our, yeah. you know, we need pipelines. Yeah. We need our startups to be bought by somebody, okay? Yeah. They're reaching a certain 
size or volume and you know but you know biggest, build, build it and they will biggest, come biggest way to do yeah. that is to actually show exits to our lps yeah when we show exits they'll put more money so yeah. this is a this is a cycle but build it and they will come that's i mean it's but it's fruit like you just focus on building the business and if it's a good business they'll they'll come in and acquire so I, it, think I think if i may add i think look this is the time that this is going to happen right the oil is down the the traditional businesses are slowing down and they're going to look to diversify before it's all gone right if you look at for example, we're, we're investors in Property Finder. Today, and if you know, if you want to be a smart developer and, and go build a building, how do you decide where you build it? The traditional way is you hire a consultant and he tells you, oh, you should build it here, and here's the configuration, two or three bedrooms. If you acquire a platform like Property Finder, it'll tell you in which area, in which location, in which city are people looking at for two or three bedroom apartments, and whereas there is an overabundance of supply or undersupply, and that will make you the smartest developer and it'll, and it'll really refresh your traditional business. So as the, some of the traditional businesses are slowing down and, and suffering and retail is down and things like that, that's when they they're start eyeballing. And you know, Imar and Hamad Abbar is a great example of that, or an example of that. But hopefully we'll see a lot of the other businesses, Al Shaya had just invested in Noon, uh, so we'll see a lot of the other businesses and traditional businesses look to diversify their and smarten up their existing businesses by acquiring uh, tech businesses. And I think that's, that's the way to kind of go hand in hand rather than look at it from a, just an acquisition and kind of revenue generate, generative business. One experiment we want to do in, inside the CC uh, is uh, they granted the fund access to the assets they, they have. So CC is the biggest telecom uh, player or operator in the region. Right. And they're going to allow uh, our portfolio companies to access the network, the channels, the user base, all those kind of telecom assets that can enable them to scale up. Uh, this is going to help SCC in multiple ways, but I can give two examples relevant to this point. First of all, this year assets are suddenly now being used in a new way that hasn't been used before. So you, now you're getting return on, uh, on these assets uh, in a different way. The assets themselves are going to adapt to the needs of those uh, digital newcomers. Uh, the other part is the CC will now monitor how these companies are using their uh, assets and they may decide, they may have the courage now to decide and uh, acquire those companies because they know they're going to integrate well into their business lines, at least some of those parts that are relevant to telecom. So this, this is another experiment we want to do and see what, what happens in the next few years. You know, there is, uh, yes, 100% I, I agree with, with my colleagues here. Uh, the retail business in Saudi Arabia, in particular, I am talking about in Saudi Arabia, it's uh, the conventional one is in a bad situation now. And it's, uh, it's very surprising to, to hear from the big guys that they are talking about that purchasing power is getting down. And people are not spending anymore like before. But when you show them some of the growth numbers in the e-commerce is happening around them and their in their business what what they they become shocked like oh there is something here happening so uh, until they reach that point and notice that the conversion is, is happening somewhere else they at that point they will start talking about acquisitions and in Saudi Arabia now we have two companies one logistics and one in retail big retail they're talking with startups to acquire them to at least be because they tried they tried to be uh, to uh, get in technology and they couldn't. They failed. So I think with with time, with this conversion, very sp high speed of conversion and amount of money that's spent in this in this area, I'm sure that we will find uh, corporates and uh, conventional businesses will acquire the startups uh, very soon. So on this good note, let me open the floor. I've been told we should close quickly. Uh, one or two questions from the floor, if there are any questions. There's one on the first row. Please identify yourself and ask a question, please. Um, my name is Yusuf Limsalim. Uh, I have a question for STV. So you just said that Saudi, to look, at first I would like to thank you all for the great insights. It was, a it was a lovely discussion. So regarding STV, so you said that STC is looking to diversify uh, their revenues and due to the current climate in the telecommunication business and the revenues from airtime being reduced, so what verticals is STV looking into in the region? Let's say the GCC region where you have uh, most of your op like the operations with the highest ARPU. Which verticals with the highest ROI STV is looking for? Uh, 
thank you. So uh, we're sector agnostic, but what we look for is companies that have the potential to become number one or number two in the markets they're working in, or at least have the potential to introduce new disruptive technologies or business models that can disrupt those uh, markets. Um, but we, since we have the uh, angle of uh, utilizing the assets that this telecom operator has, uh, we put priority on areas where those assets can actually come be employed into helping those companies overcome barriers to scale issues. Well, I've just been signaled that they're going to switch the mics off. <laughs> so it's time for me to thank the panel. We were only getting started. Well, that's what <laughs> I was getting to, but I've just been told it, you know. And uh, so thank you very much. I must thank, thank my you. panelists, Yusuf, Walid, Omar, Faris. Thank you very much. A lot of you have come from very long distance. Thank you for coming and Thanks. sharing your insights.